Okay, here we are again, nearing the end uh, to the most exciting part of the semester. Uh, we're here to discuss economic policy. Uh, try to stay awake. Uh, I promise you this will be a shorter batch of slides, um, among the shorter batches of slides uh, compared to what we've seen thus far throughout the semester. Um, uh, what I'm doing now is, is using the Barber section of her chapter 10 uh, as a starting point where she discusses economic policy and then I'll transition very quickly into Katznelson. Uh, I don't have that many slides and a lot of them are um, figures and graphs and things. So anyway, economic policy we know makes the world go round. Um, economic policy is more or less just the, the broad term to include anything that has to do with dollars and cents. But we'll talk about fiscal policy, which kind of overlaps with tax policy. Monetary policy is a slightly different thing. Regulatory policy is very real, um, but has more to do with just how banking works. Uh, and I'll talk very superficially about that very quickly. Um, you know I'm not going to ask you any sort of essay question on the final exam to for you to write out the nuances among these types of policies. So don't sweat it. I just want you to understand really the big picture concepts of what we're talking about so you can better understand the news when you hear news about uh, economic policy um, in the U.S. government. So obviously, you know, the, the United States economy is the largest in the world uh, still for the time being. Um, and what the government does uh, and the role it plays in the market economy uh, is very consequential and important, uh, requiring economic policies in the plural, but also really zooming out requires that the government uh, do even more than that, more than just set economic policies. We need the government to ensure law and order, right? We're going back to very early in the semester, the big picture things the governments do. Uh, if we don't have law and order, it's pretty hard to think about tax policy, right? Um, we need property rights. We need to know that um, when we participate in the economy, what we exchange, what we buy, what we receive, what we earn, uh, will be protected, right? That it is ours um, and that property that belongs to others is theirs uh, and so on and so forth. And by extension, of course, we need uh, a government there to enforce contracts, right? Um, I very recently, uh, for the first time in my, in my life, uh, sort of became an adult. Uh, my wife and I bought a house. We locked in an interest rate uh, and you know, uh, with this document, this contract, I can assume then that our lender isn't going to come back in two or three years and say, oh, by the way, you know, we're, we want to bump up this interest rate so that you pay us a lot more money, right? That would be illegal. That's not how it works in the United States. That's not what we agreed to in a contract. So there we go, right? I can count on the government whether that's the federal government or the state government in Texas to have my back here, we need governments to enforce contracts, right? And that's an extension of property rights and law and order right there. So in other words, lumping all this together and, and, and transitioning into talking more specifically about economic policies, uh, we know that we need public policies and by extension, the government uh, to set the rules of the market, right? We need laws, rules, statutes, et cetera, uh, that express the government's goals and rewards and punishes those and punishments to promote their attainment uh, as the markets, uh, as the rules of the markets are, right? So, you know, if, if, if one half of a contract violates that contract, they need to know that there is punishment for doing so and what that is, right? So we need, we need rules, right? We can't just have a totally unregulated market, right? If the government had, um, an exclusively hands-off approach to economic policy, what might happen? Well, we have some examples within the last hundred years. Uh, we could think about the Great Depression, right? Uh, the stock market crash of the 1920s, late 1920s, transitioning very seamlessly into a Great Depression, um, the response to which involved a great expansion of the federal government's role in uh, the economic life of our country and uh, a lot of what changed then in the 1930s remains today, right? Uh, with limited exceptions, we could identify, say, deregulation of the banking industry in the 1990s that led to, in no small part, the 2008 financial disaster, right? We watched a documentary, Inequality for All, uh, that had a lot to do with the reverberations, the consequences of 
um, the 2008 financial disaster, which had a lot to do with uh, the banking industry having made uh, loans to folks who couldn't pay them off, couldn't pay their mortgage, uh, and then led to a wave of house repossessions uh, and a near crash of the entire banking industry. Uh, and again, the roots of the 2008 financial disaster had a lot to do with um, the deregulation of the banking industry in the 1990s, uh, which was done under uh, President Clinton's watch, right? So there we go, right? So let's think about broader goals of economic policy. We could talk about the promotion of market stability, right? Uh, again, to return to some earlier points, we need uh, the government more broadly to to in, to provide law and order in in the economic system. Uh, laws exist to ensure competition, right? It, ironically, you know, I don't necessarily think of competition and stability two terms used in the same sentence, but we need competition among economic actors, right? So what we mean by this is we need government to provide to to uh, impose laws that ensure competition, which means to limit monopolies, right? Monopolies uh, lead to uh, entities becoming so big uh, that they don't need to abide by the rules of the market, right? Supply and demand go out the window and say the setting of prices for goods that you and I purchase um, if there is a monopoly. So this hyperlink here will take you to a rather comedic uh, analysis by Hassan Minaj a uh, stand-up comedian uh, and political satirist uh, who used to have a show on Netflix called The Patriot Act, uh, but uh, it was canceled. But uh, this bit that he does, it's its over 20 minutes long, as I recall, uh, on uh, Amazon and its role as a burgeoning monopoly in our economy uh, is pretty informative. I'm imagining, I imagine that most of you watching this uh, lecture video right now have at some point in time used Amazon, and many of you are likely uh, paying Amazon Prime customers. I am too. Uh, I'm not blaming anyone for, you know, perhaps uh, doing their part to, uh, you know, create a monopoly and, and thus uh, endanger our economy because I'm part of the problem too. But it's worth understanding what's going on every time you buy something from Amazon, and this will explain it uh, in pretty accessible terms. Uh, but beyond ensuring competition or preventing monopolies, we need the government to provide consistent regulatory structures. So particularly businesses, but also consumers uh, have an understanding of uh, what they're buying and what they're selling and what the rules that 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 regulate that will be. Right. Uh, and this is also a real point of political contention between Republicans and Democrats has been for quite a, a number of decades, oftentimes with. Uh, Republicans uh, less partial to regulating, say, how a good is produced uh, or safety standards and so on and so forth, and Democrats arguing in favor of them. But um, it's safe to say that the regulatory structure has been uh, more consistent than maybe some wish to acknowledge, but, uh, but there we are. There are, um, you know, this is a legitimate point of contention and reasonable people can disagree on uh, what reasonableness of uh, regulation is uh, in the system. But beyond that, uh, or, or moving beyond this, um, we can think about uh, the promotion of prosperity, obviously, as a, as a goal of economic policy. And this is a little more uh, tangible. We can, we can measure this uh, as best we can, however imperfectly these indicators might be. We could consider economic growth, uh, in the form of GDP, gross domestic product, uh, is the size of uh, the economy, right? In effect, what uh, the U.S. economy produces in the course of a year, right? That's the gross domestic product. Um, I think the U.S. economy uh, currently uh, moves around about 25, 24, 25, 26 trillion dollars a year, uh, a number that's not very fathomable for most of us, I assume. Uh, I still am having trouble thinking in trillions. Um, we could look at it that way, the whole of the economy. We could look at income and how that often works out. It's a bit crude, but we take the gross domestic product and divide it by the number of, of people working in the economy. And that gives us uh, the idea or an idea of what incomes look like or GDP per capita, we call this, right? Per capita literally means per head. 
um, per working person. Uh, right now, uh, I think the per capita income in the United States is somewhere in the low $60,000, right? So um, that doesn't mean that everyone earns that much. There are uh, uh, some people who earn a heck of a lot more than that and a lot of people who earn much and, and, and a great many number of people who earn less than that. But that is, you know, just taking the economy in its total, in its totality, dividing it by the number of people in the workforce and giving us an idea of what incomes are. But we can look at the annual changes in GDP, either in absolute terms or per capita, thus looking at income. And as long as those numbers go up, uh, economists and politicians tend to be pretty uh, comfortable. Uh, a good year of growth in the United States is around three, four, five percent would be amazing. Um, below three percent usually uh, provides cause for concern. Uh, and when we see income stagnate like that, we often see employment levels drop or unemployment levels go up. Um, uh, uh, safe, comfortable for economists, unemployment level in the United States is about 5% unemployment or 95% employment. We consider that around, we consider that 95% employment number to be what we call full employment. Um, when it goes above that, economists and politicians start to worry. 10% uh, is really high. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, immediately after the pandemic took root in March, April of 2020, I think unemployment hit about 16%, and that's official numbers, so it was probably closer to 20 um, and that's not good for the economy, right? Uh, other economies like Japan, uh, full employment is considered 98%. Uh, in Spain, full employment is considered about 90%, so it can vary from place to place, uh, from economist to economist. But these numbers, you know, whether they trend up or trend down, uh, are how we measure economic prosperity. Uh, we also consider uh, inflation numbers. Inflation is a rise in price uh, of goods that we buy. And by extension, another way to conceptualize inflation is a decrease in the value of the money that you have. Right. So we want inflation to be pretty low. Traditionally, in recent decades, um, it has been rather low. Um, inflation hit a recent high in late 2021. Uh, I think it was at the, the it's been at the highest uh, level it's been since 1990. But comparatively speaking, because of the strength and size of the U.S. economy, um, compared to other countries, even when inflation is high in the United States, whether it's 1990 or 2021, it's still comparatively rather low to other uh, developed economies and in particular to developing economies. Um, I don't think in late 2021 we have reason to freak out just yet uh, regarding inflation, but it has ticked up uh, in recent months. Uh, let's think about tools of economic policy, more specifically monetary policy. Uh, and again, this is this is my one slide on monetary policy. I'm not going to ask you an essay question about this. So as long as you understand just the, the, the biggest picture concepts, you're good. Uh, and that picture says this, monetary policy regulates the economy through the manipulation of the supply of money and credit. The federal government can make it easier or harder, by which I mean cheaper or more expensive, for us to borrow money, right? Uh, and that's the big us. That's us as individuals. That's us as companies. That's us as a government. Um, but the Federal Reserve System exists to implement monetary policy. Um, the federal system sets what we call the discount rate um, and reserve requirement. This has to do with the amount of cash that banks must have on hand, right? Um, in theory, we could all walk into our banks uh, and say, hey, give me all the money that I have on deposit uh, at this bank. Uh, now, if I did this, if you did this any given you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, no big deal. But if we all went to the bank um, at the same time and, and, and withdrew our money, not enough cash would be at that bank to pay us, right? Um, but the federal government insists at a, on a minimum level that banks must have on hand uh, to hand cash to their clients, right? That then, the flip side of that coin, limits the amount of money that banks can lend out. And that's how banks make most of their money, by lending, loaning money out to consumers, either co corporations, businesses, uh, individuals. Um, and again, the if, if by law they have to have more money in the bank, that's less that they can loan out. And when interest rates 
say are pretty low um, and uh, the federal government might be worried about the amount of money circulating through the system, maybe not wanting us to, to borrow more money, extend ourselves in that way, then the, federals, the federal government can, uh, through the Federal Reserve, raise the reserve requirement to keep more money in banks, right? Um, government, the government, the federal government can also uh, influence how much money is circulating into the system uh, outside of, of the bank uh, or within the system, the government system itself, by buying and selling bonds, right? So we can, in effect, loan the government money to uh, TOO by buying bonds, right? The government will sell us a bond, which is in effect a note that says, in the future, we will give you X amount of dollars, right? So I could buy a bond by giving the government, just to use a, a simple amount, uh, $40 now uh, with the promise that in 10 years time, I will present this document to the federal government via a bank and the bank will give me $50 back. That's, that's, a, that's a nice return on my investment, but in theory, um, you know, if I'd invested this in a private stock, I probably would have earned a lot more, which is to say bonds are a safer bet for investors. Um, and it's an easy way for the government to borrow money from consumers without say raising taxes. Um, but uh, again, it's, it's, it's a, it's kind of a win-win in the short term. It's a medium term for everybody, right? Um, I get uh, by buying a government bond, a very safe investment, even though the payoff is much less, the government can borrow money from uh, its citizens without increasing taxes, right? Um, so that is another way that the government can uh, influence the shape, the amount of money and credit flowing through the system. Uh, the government also sets the federal funds rate, which is the interest rate that banks borrow money, banks borrow and loan money to each other. Banks do this to, to get around restrictions on the reserve requirement. So if a bank realizes, oh, hey, I've loaned out too much money, I'll just borrow a bank or I'll borrow money from another private bank um, that has money to loan me uh, without dipping below its, its reserve requirements so that I can keep cash on hand to meet mine. Um, and that interest rate is lower than what you and I pay for interest rates on a home loan or a car loan or a credit card. Um, but the, the, the interest rates we do pay as consumers are very much shaped by the federal funds rate that is set by the federal government, again, for the purposes of private banks lending money to each other. So anyway, I know that's kind of confusing, but you will hear this discussed in the news. I will not ask you an essay question on the exam, so don't sweat it. If that made absolutely no sense to you, you, you will still pass the class. Don't worry. Um, if you're a business major, that should make sense to you. Anyway, this is the, the current head of the Federal Reserve uh, System, uh, Jerome Powell. Uh, I believe he's a lawyer by training um, with an undergraduate degree in economics, but I think he's the first um, head of the Federal Reserve in some time who does not have uh, a PhD in economics. Uh, the head of the Federal Reserve is appointed by the president, but to a fixed term. Uh, Powell was appointed by former President Trump, uh, but because his position is viewed or is meant to be non-political, um, a president appoints the head of the Federal Reserve, and I forget how long the term is, five years, 10 years, but um, you know, a, a new president could perhaps force the head of the Federal Reserve out and replace them. Uh, President Trump did that with the former head of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, um, but I don't think uh, President Biden has it in the cards to replace Jerome Powell uh, at present, respecting the independence of the position. Um, beyond monetary policy, we could talk about fiscal and tax policies. There's a lot of overlap between the two, um, but this has to do with how the government seeks to regulate the economy through the redistribution of money. Um, so not so much the policies that shape how we borrow money, but um, the redistribution of, of money itself. Uh, and this is done through the Treasury Department, not through the Federal Reserve. So uh, as Katz Nelson describes in his text, these two institutions are very much meant to be separate uh, and independent from each other to provide more stability to the economic system. But how this is done, uh, the Treasury Department, if you've ever paid income tax, and I, we all pay income tax if we work, but if you've ever paid income tax when you file your taxes, 
Um, as young as many of you are, you likely don't, uh, but someday you likely will, and you will have to write a check, uh, if we still do this in the 21st century, uh, to the Treasury Department. And it sucks to do that. I've had to do it lots of times. It's not fun. Um, but uh, there are all types of taxes that we pay. Um, we could uh, think about tariffs. Uh, which is traditionally, and you'll see a graph in a sec, how uh, the U.S. government financed itself for quite some time until into the 20th century. But tariffs are taxes that the federal government imposes on uh, imports. Uh, these are often taxes that we're not very aware of. Uh, we, we still pay them to some extent today, although the United States has free trade agreements with lots of, lots of other countries around the world. Uh, the government might impose a tariff uh, or an import tax on goods, say like steel, uh, when the U.S. government wants to protect domestic consumption. Uh, and the way this works is the importer pays the tax to the government and then passes that cost on to the consumer. So oftentimes we don't see tariffs when we pay them. Uh, we do see income tax, right? If you've ever looked at your pay stub, you see what federal income is withheld. And then if you ever look at your tax return, you can see uh, what your grand total, your annual total is of, of income tax paid um, to the federal government uh, or to certain state governments. Uh, the state of Texas doesn't have an income tax. Uh, corporations pay tax on their income as well in theory. Uh, however, in practice, many uh, large corporations do not. Uh, the hyperlink here will take you to a John Oliver discussion of the corporate tax system in the United States. Uh, it is comical. There are dirty jokes, um, but it is extremely informative. It will probably raise an eyebrow if you're not aware of the fact uh, that corporations uh, really get do their best uh, to, to not pay income tax, and they're pretty good at doing that, uh, at not paying tax. But anyway, have a watch of that if you like. Uh, we'll come back to talking about corporate taxes in a sec. Uh, Social Security taxes, we all pay. Uh, we all pay into the Social Security system when we, when we work. Uh, and the idea is that people who are currently working, uh, who contribute Social Security taxes to the, to the system, then uh, pays for um, Social Security benefits to be paid out to currently retired people, right? This is one of those distributive uh, policies that we talked about last time around. Um, it's not redistributive per se. It's not that the wealthy pay to support the poor. It's that everyone pays in. Everyone who's working is paying in to support everyone who has retired. Uh, and the theory being that everyone who's currently retired has already paid into the system. So it's, it's distributing money in, a, in that way. It's not redistributing from wealthy to poor, which is the essence of redistributive policies, which we covered last time around. Uh, we also can think about excise tax. Excise taxes are, are things that are paid uh, like a supplemental tax on certain goods. Uh, we pay excise tax on alcohol, damn it. We pay excise tax on uh, tobacco, those of us who use it. Uh, we pay excise tax on gasoline, right? About uh, to around 19 cents, I think, 20, we'll call it 20 cents uh, of uh, federal taxes you pay on every gallon of gasoline you buy. Not 20%, but 20 cents. So if you know the market price for gasoline, we'll just say is $3 a gallon, uh, about 20 cents of that goes directly to the federal government every time you fill up your car. So if your car's like mine, it's got about 10 gallon capacity, um, uh, I fill that up, uh, thus about $2 of every tank of gas I buy goes directly to the federal government, right? Um, the last time the gas tax went up in the United States, most of you were probably not born. Bill Clinton was president. It was the 1990s. Um, and you can imagine why it's taken so long for the excise tax on, on gasoline to go up. Um, because no one wants to raise it, right? No politician wants to run for re-election in the House or the Senate as being the person who voted to raise the gasoline tax, right? The price of gasoline is such a loaded political issue in the United States that uh, really it's to our own detriment that uh, the gasoline tax has not gone up in recent memory because that's money that's used to maintain federal highways, interstates and the federal highway system. So anyway, jokes on us for not wanting to pay tax, but um, uh, that's where we're at, right? 
Um, beyond that, and continuing on the issue of the politicization of taxes, uh, the text describes progressive and regressive taxes. Um, both Barber and Katznelson talk about these. Um, progressive taxes are taxes that go up as a proportion of your income uh, as your income increases. So the income tax, particularly at the federal level, federally, is progressive. The more money you earn, the higher percent uh, of that you pay in federal income tax. Regressive taxes are flat taxes. These are taxes that we all pay the same amount regardless of how much we earn. So think about it this way. You go uh, to the local Target and you buy, I don't know, um, a table of some kind uh, for $20. And if you're in most of Bear County, uh, you'll pay, I think it's 8.25% sales tax on that $20 cheapo table. Now, you'll pay that amount regardless. Anyone who buys that same table or anything of that same value is going to pay the same amount in sales tax. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are, how poor you are, how much you earn, how much you have in the bank. Regressive taxes are the, the same amount regardless of how much you earn. And we call it regressive because it, in effect, takes more money as a percentage, though, out of the pocket of those with less money, right? So again, the 8.25% you pay in sales tax, so, you know, $1.70 on, uh, or Sixteen fifty, I guess, on uh, a twenty dollar purchase. That's that that dollar and sixty five cents. Uh, uh, sorry, is what that would be is uh, as a percentage more out of your pocket if you earn fifty thousand dollars a year than if you earn five hundred thousand dollars in a year. Right? Most of us don't earn five hundred thousand dollars in a year, so most of us end up paying more out of our pocket in sales tax than wealthy people do. Right? We all pay the same percent on the amount purchased, but it's less out of the pocket of a wealthy person than it is out of someone who earns less, right? That's what regressive taxation is. So to illustrate the point a bit more clearly, this is directly out of the Katz-Nelson text. If you read it, you've hopefully recognized this, table 9.3. Katz-Nelson is very much into uh, presenting data in the form of, of quintiles. So the quintiles is just a fancy word for a fifth, but uh, we've got uh, income broken down by fifths of income earners in the United States. So uh, the lowest 20% in 2011 had an average cash income of $13,000, paid 5% in federal income tax and 12.3% in state and local taxes with a total tax bill, total tax bill of about 17%. And as incomes go up, so the poorest, the second poorest 20%, the middle 20%, the um, second wealthiest 20%, uh, we see the incomes go up and we see federal income tax as a percent of their income go up too. What we notice here with state and local taxes is, is they don't really go up at all. If anything, they go down a hair. Um, and this is to, to, this indicates the regressive taxation of particularly sales tax but uh, worth reminding ourselves as well, as Katz Nelson points out in, in chapter nine, that uh, most state income tax uh, levels are relatively flat, um, progressive to an extent, uh, but not nearly as, as um, progressive as federal income tax is. Uh, but when you put the two together, you can see that um, the overall taxation system in the United States, accounting for federal and state and local taxes, um, progressive-ish, but really by the time you get to the to the wealthiest 20% of the population, it levels out. It really plateaus. Um, so once you hit the top 1%, um, which would be for average uh, individuals earning $1.3 million uh, in a year, um, you don't really see the tax go up much beyond that as a percentage of income, right? You might ask yourself, why not? Um, and that's a very legitimate question. Uh, our policymakers, who of course make policy in function of, um, in part, what we want as voters, but also in part uh, in function of what um, paying donors and lobbyists want, uh, helps us to understand why uh, tax levels plateau and don't keep rising as incomes rise. 
Um, we'll get to, we'll return to this notion in just a second. Um, here is a, I don't know what we want to call this, time plot graph figure thingy uh, from a different textbook that I've used in the past um, on U.S. federal government. But this just gives you a historical visual overview of how the federal government has financed itself going back to 1790 uh, up to 2010, or how the, the federal government financed itself, because uh, not has financed, because 2010 is in the past, this is done. Um, but if, for the longest time, from the founding to the early 20th century, it was tariffs uh, that um, provided the largest source of income, right? And remember, tariffs are imports on, uh, or sorry, taxes on imported goods. As the United States developed a large consumer economy, uh, which particularly occurred after World War II, we see tariffs uh, go by the wayside. Uh, Republicans in particular, Democrats got on board shortly thereafter. By the late 20th century, it seemed like there was general consensus in the United States that tariffs were bad because they rose prices uh, for consumer goods and thus on consumers. So instead of taxing tariffs, uh, why not just tax the consumer? Right. And that's what's happened. I mean, we're going to pay taxes either way, either on the goods we buy or the income we earn. But that's what uh, that's what's happened. We see this dark blue here is uh, income tax on individuals. This makes up a substantial chunk of um, government revenue. Right. How the government supports itself. Corporate taxes came about a little prior to uh, individual income tax. But corporate taxes, if you've watched the John Oliver video, you know that corporate taxes are uh, increasingly lower uh, and have been reduced in recent years since 2010. Uh, I imagine this sliver here is even lower uh, there. The red is social insurance tax. This is what we pay directly out of our paychecks uh, to the social security system, right? Excise tax as well is, has dwindled. Um, I imagine this has something to do with uh, us smoking much less Number one, but number two, I think it's also indicative of the fact that uh, the excise tax on gasoline has not gone up uh, in your lifetime, right? Uh, this link here, this hyperlink here, how should we fund the government, will take you to uh, a national public radio story from November of 2021 um, that uh, presents the debate on whether or not we should have perhaps a wealth tax in the United States, a federal wealth tax. Uh, on um, either multimillionaires or billionaires and how much money that might provide the federal government. Uh, ask yourself whether or not you think that's a good idea. Again, reasonable people can have drastically different opinions uh, on the topic. But um, I just want you to, to go forth from this class thinking about these things um, if you never have before or think about them in more comprehensive ways than you have before. Um, but anyway, looking at this here, this gives you a, a crystal clear uh, confirmation of what's on the pre previous slide here, where we see the percentage of um, tax receipts by source. Um, income tax is held relatively steady uh, since the post-World War II era kicked off. Uh, but what we do definitely see here is corporation uh, income tax go down. And again, um, over a decade after 2010, this corporate tax number is even lower. Uh, social insurance and retirement receipts uh, has gone up over time. And I have a feeling that as, uh, our, as our population ages, more people retire and live longer and wealthy societies have fewer children that we're going to need to pay more and more uh, into the social insurance system if you want there to be social security for you when you retire. Uh, I'm already worried about this in my very early 40s. Um, and I'm worried that by the time I hit 65, if that's your retirement age, if it's 70, if it's 75, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna be there for my retirement. And I've already paid in a lot more to it than you have. Um, but this will be a political issue for you to think about in your lifetime, I guarantee it. Um, it Continuing with the illustrating of points here, you can see excise tax uh, having dropped precipitously uh, as a source of government revenue, and that's by government choice. The federal government uh, might uh, give us the shaft a bit by lowering corporate taxes and requiring us as individuals to pay more in income tax. Um, 
I don't think it's doing us any favors, the federal government, by not raising the gas tax um, directly. But again, the federal government uh, will screw us over when we let it, but I don't think we would forgive anyone in the federal government for raising the price of gasoline, rightly or wrongly. Um, but anyway, moving on here, uh, let's think about government spending, because that's the flip side of the coin. Why does the government tax us? Well, it taxes us to raise revenue to then spend money, right? Uh, you can see over time uh, what the government has spent has drastically increased from 1950 to 2010 in absolute terms. Very much so. The absolute dollar figures have gone through the roof. Um, the percent of GDP um, necessarily... Uh, has uh, not gone up as much, although it has a bit. You can see receipts here. So this is what the government taxes. What the government brings in uh, is up to about a quarter, the equivalent of the quarter of the economy. What the government spends is over a third. Now, what does that mean? The government brings in, in 2010, government brought in um, $3.58 trillion. Um, that's what that is there. Uh, numbers are in billions of dollars, so that's you know three there uh, over um, uh, in, out of the billions takes us into the trillions, three point five trillion. But it's spent over five trillion in two thousand and ten. What does that mean then, folks? The government runs a deficit, right? Um, uh, or well, any given year we call what the government spends more than it takes in is a deficit. The sum total is the government debt. Uh, and we see in recent decades, well, I use the term recent uh, a bit loosely because we're going back to, to the 70s here before Larson was even born. Um, but the government used to balance the budget, right? Used to be uh, a thing where the government didn't spend much more than it brought in. Um, since a major oil crisis in 1973 uh, and then into the 70s, pretty turbulent decade in world history, uh, the United States began the uh, tradition of spending more than it took in. Um, the Cold War, the end of the Cold War was very expensive. Um, Ronald Reagan did a good job of outspending the Soviet Union, uh, which in no small part contributed uh, to the Soviet uh, collapse. That had a lot to do with military spending, which we seem to be okay with. Um, but by the 90s, the Clinton administration balanced the budget. So uh, we had a, a budget surplus for a few years where the tax revenue was more than what the government spent. Then the Bush administration said, we can't have that. Uh, and instead of paying down the debt, the Bush administration decided to cut taxes and give us um, refunds in effect. Um, and that drove the debt up or the, the deficit uh, in successive years. And here we go. Um, you know, the, the, the deficit was reduced a bit uh, in the early uh, Bush year or late Bush years and into the Obama, uh, early Obama years. And then uh, the crisis of 2009, 8, 9, then required a lot of government spending that drove uh, deficits again and the overall debt. And here we are. Right. So uh, that money will eventually have to be paid back. Uh, and that's going to be uh, on us, you and me both in the short term. Uh, to do this in the longer term, it's going to be you because Larson's going to retire here in a couple, two, three decades. Um, but anyway, and I don't see the uh, budget being balanced. I mean, even if the budget is balanced, uh, that just prevents the debt from growing, but the deficit's still going to be there. So uh, I'm a bit skeptical and pessimistic about this in the long term. Um, this, I believe, is my last slide, and I'll let you go. Uh, but let's look at this comparatively. Again, this is straight from the Katz Nelson book, which you hopefully recognize. Um, the United States here, uh, in terms of taxation, uh, comparing the United States to other wealthy democracies, um, the United States is among the lowest taxing country uh, in the developed world, uh, again, with taxation making up about a quarter of uh, the, the economy, the GDP. In 2010, these numbers haven't changed a lot uh, in the intervening decade. Uh, when it comes to spending, that's what outlay means. It's a fancy word that just means government spending. Uh, the United States spends more than it brings in. Uh, and you'll notice that most countries do seem to spend more than they bring in. Uh, most countries like the United States have to borrow money from other countries, um, particularly China. Um, but uh, yeah, the United States does not spend 
nearly as much as most other uh, developed democracies do. Uh, and we'll get to the hows and the whys of that, particularly when we think when we talk about social spending or social policy, which we'll do next time around. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, got you out of here faster, sooner than I have in a lot of other weeks. Uh, so there we are. Uh, use your time wisely. Take care. Be in touch. Bye-bye.